Welcome to A Chat With Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm here to guide us on this journey of heartfelt and uncensored conversations with friends I've met while touring my music in Europe and across North America, and people who have life experience that I genuinely believe we can all learn from. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut up. Yum, yum, yum. I just downed what I call chocolate delight. Dale and I make them. What it is is basically dark chocolate, top and bottom, and then almond butter, nuts, some other shit in the middle. You cool it in the fridge, and then you make a mess with it all over your face and it mostly in your mouth. I just had one of those, and I'm ready to do this intro. My guest today has a great laugh, and uh, as Dale and I were editing this episode, I was disappointed in how my laugh sounds. I can tell I'm a bit nervous, and it could be red light syndrome. In music, that's when a person has talent, but once they're being recorded, they fall to pieces. Symptoms of red light syndrome include pale skin, cold sweats, frequent mistakes. That's me in this episode. Anyway, who cares? Life shouldn't be about being comfortable all the time. I love this chat. My guest today is a close friend of mine. Her name is Lucy de Couter. She's a captain in the Royal Canadian Air Force. But you may recognize her because she starred as Lucy in the Trailer Park Boys. Or perhaps she taught your kindergarten class in South Korea. Or maybe you know her from the Vagina Monologues. We covered a lot of ground in this chat with heart. Lucy's done a lot of things. She is on my speed dial for when I need advice. She's a courage laden. I made that word up. I combined those two words, laden and courage. And I guess I put a hyphen in the middle. I don't know if anybody else has done that, but I, I looked it up on Google because I was like, is this, can I say courage laden? Makes, I don't even know. I don't, I struggle with finding any words in the English language. But anyway, when I was thinking of how to describe her, I came up with Courage Laden. Uh, she's a Courage Laden female force of inspiration. That's what I think. Oh, update. Uh, Dale has shamed me and uh, informed me that Laden is actually pronounced Laden. So she is a Courage Laden female force of inspiration, not a Courage Laden. I think I said Laden because of my German background and studying, I think in, if Leiden, L-A-D-E-N, were, was a, a German word, then I think it would be pronounced Laden. Anyway, oh, I have a terrible word. language. I hope you enjoy uh, one of the first chats with heart, and please uh, let us know what you think afterwards. First of all, uh, Lucy, do you care? Do you care? Right? Thank, that's... You for pri- Thank you for using the correct reference point and the yeah. correct pronunciation. I've been working on it. Um, welcome really to good. a chat with Heart podcast. It You're one of the first. <sighs> you're one of the first for season one. Absolutely honored that you said yes to this dress. And I, of course, I'm going to say, you're kidding. That's my favorite dress. I, I have some warm up questions that I made last night and then by then we'll be all warmed up and and I mean we are I already feel warmed up okay you ready (laughs) I'm gonna start with the hard one it's gonna get easier okay number one okay what is the hardest thing about being alive oh it's just never ending like oh it's gonna end I I know that I I I don't know um 
I think the hardest thing about being alive is uh, obviously varies from person to person, but it's a lot of trying, huh? Yeah, trial and error. I hear you. Just, just like trying, like, oh, I guess I'm going to try that. Mm. It could be every, you're always trying. Well, you're always trying. Thank Not you. everybody is always trying, <laughs> but like. Not everyone knows how or what to do or feels the need to try. A lot of, a lot of people feel like they don't need to try because they already arrived. But I feel like I'm always trying. And sometimes I would love to be that person who's like, no, I'm good. Life is trying. I know. I know you're trying. And all of the meanings of the word trying, like sometimes continuously trying can be very trying. There's a guy I'm thinking of who is like the most boring person I've probably ever met. Say his name. He is, he, say his name. Can't. (laughs) Um, Mike. I'm going to get him on the podcast. I'm going to get Mike on the podcast. Yeah. And we're going to pick him up. My God. He's He's so boring. He's on hold right now. Oh, hey, Mike. Mike. What's up? What's new? It is what it is. Oh, yeah. How's your day? Another day closer to Monday. Okay. Like, you know, at least he has his, at least he has the answers to every question you throw at him. Like I, yeah. Uh, throw me like, what do we have? Hey, I don't know. How did you like that? How did you like that movie? It's different. Oh. <laughs> Fuck off. If you were told you had to leave everything behind to go on a spaceship to Mars because our planet was going to blow up, but you were permitted to take one item from your kitchen that is currently there now, what item would that be and why? Microplaner. You have a microplaner? Microplaner. What is that? It's long yeah. and it is a grater that is good for hard things like Parmesan cheese mm. or garlic or uh, um, whatever that you don't want to chop. Whatever they yeah. might have on Mars growing. In- yeah, and I feel like Mars is hard. I would probably would actually be like, you know what? Just leave me here. But because I don't want to go to Mars. I don't want to do, oh my God, all the you trying that you would have to do. I know, I know. You I have to. You or, have to in this scenario. You or have to. You're what? leaving. Well, you're, or, I guarantee you, if your place was about to melt, like you were going to die, you would say yes to this option. Sounds like this is something that happened to you. No, I never think we, did. Can get, we can get into uh, that later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I take my microplaner because I think other folks would take knives and shit. Yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah, there's other people that are coming. I should have mentioned that. Yeah. And they're good at sharing and they're nice. And I don't want oh, to share those. No. Here's another one. Uh, <laughs> what would I have to do to make you never want to speak to me again? Lie. Yeah. Okay. That was easy. But lying is so lazy. It's just really cheap. There's never a really a reason to lie. I'm protecting you. No, you're not. Yeah, I you're afraid of the truth. Yeah, yeah. Like I could, uh, like you could do something awful. I don't know what that would be. And if I don't know that you did something awful, I can't deal with it. Yeah. And then one lie begets another. Whereas if you're like, so I just want you to know, I have done this terrible thing. Yeah. It would be a bummer to know that, but like at least it's something I can work with. Yeah, it's how you build and trust with someone. I think you come not out lying say, to them is the number one way to build trust with somebody. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing a little girl lie to me, and she couldn't talk really. It was a girl, woman now, but she was uh, not allowed to take toys to daycare, and there was a really good toy. It was a Weeble. They wobble, hmm. but those fuckers they don't fall down. I knew that uh, she wasn't allowed to take toys to daycare, and so I was like, "Hey, let's go!" And she's like put this in your bag. Mm. I knew it wasn't hers. Uh, and I said, oh, um, what? this is an amazing toy. Where did you get it? And she just said to me, not daycare. So, wow, that kid is going to be so easy. Whoever gets involved with that <laughs> person is going to know when they're lying no, because they're just going to say not and then the opposite of what the thing yeah. is. Yeah. Okay, picture this. You're in palliative care. It's not looking like you're going to make it past the next hour. Who in your life uh, would you wish Uh to spend your last hour alive with? Anyone who's kind enough to show up. There are a lot of kind people. I mean, I don't have a person. No. Uh, And and when I say I don't have a person, that's not because I don't know anybody. It's because there are a lot of good faces flying around my head right now. It's interesting, though, because a lot of people would say a parent's or a sibling 
I guess I would want to be around someone whom I know they are safe for me. So I would like to be around people who are safe and lovely. Okay. Or by oh. myself. I don't know if that's a tragic thing to die by yourself. Also, if I'm in palliative care and I know I'm going to die in an hour. Yeah. Fucking hook me up with some mushrooms, bro. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, there'll be, I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, hallucinogenic. By then, opioids. surely. Yeah. If not, I mean, I'm planning on starting that anyway, like when I hit kind of 79, 80. Just start leaning hard into hallucinogenics? Well, I want to try more things. I don't want to do it now because I'm, I have to work through too much stuff and I've kind of made personal commitments to stay fairly sober, but I, I, but I want to, I want to try like harder stuff and like, um, like, yeah, hallucinogenics for sure. Like LSD someday I'd like to try cocaine, but like, I don't know. I want it to be like high grade, do that later. like sort of under supervision ish. I don't know what that means. Like a I know a musician. Friend. I know. I know a musician who has a really good line on pharmaceutical cocaine. His name. Oh, fuck. You're going to give his he's name. Is that, is, is that first... okay? Is that legal? I think so. he's got two first names. Like Keith Richards, I think. Oh my God. <laughs> right. <laughs> If it isn't obvious, I love conversation games. When the pandemic started and all of our tour dates were canceled, my husband and guitar player Dale and I did what so many other musicians had to do. We started gigging online. Conversation games helped me connect and engage with my audience. They break the ice, they can lead to laughs. I even like it when the answers take the chat to a more serious place. Right now, I'm going to read a card from one of my favorite conversation games, and you, Dale, are going to answer it. Sounds good. So this question is from the game Fluster, which you, my listeners, can buy at www.flustergame.com. And bonus, save 15% with my promo code, Christina15. Dale, this might be a weird question coming from me, your wife. What's a deal breaker for you on a first date? Uh, a deal breaker uh, for me it probably would be <laughs> your stomach making yeah. those noises. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's stomach making horrible noises. Dale's, your stomach me. just is really getting in the way of us recording. We just ate. <laughs> um, yeah, what's a deal breaker? Uh, a deal breaker for me on the first date would be um, my date talking about themselves constantly and not asking any questions. Okay. If you were to enroll in a post-secondary program tomorrow, what would your major be? Oh, well, first of all, I wouldn't because I've already done that <laughs> and I don't want to go back to uh, formal education. Um, okay, if I had to, uh, if I was bestowed such a wonderful opportunity, <laughs> uh, I would have to say, what would it be? I guess music. Because it's, oddly enough, the one thing that I want to make more time for, struggle with making more time for, I never seem in my mind to get better at it, uh, you know, to like at the level that I, I want to be. So I think, yeah, I'd enroll in a music program. Fair enough. All right. Well, that was fun. Uh, now let's get back to my chat with Lucy. Why do you think people wax their assholes? Oh, porn. That's it. Yeah, that's wait yes. to be in porn to be because, or because of porn. porn. Oh, because because of, of porn because they're all their assholes are waxed. I didn't know this. Um. Yeah, it's for porn, and I haven't. I don't know about um, porn that's targeted for gay men, but I have seen porn that's targeted for straight men. Mm -hmm. which is like the least sexy thing like there literally there is sex but I'm like that's not for the lady person um mm. but it's it's really just for that like because it's impossible to kind of do it well to yourself I it's hard I could not I don't want it's anyone like unless Dale was like we were bored That's and true. as a joke like as a fun experience kind of like, hey will you wax, wax my i don't even think he would want to wax my asshole i don't 
and the hair is there for a reason um does it and st- i what is the reason i think it stops butt shaving okay i have literally never thought about this but um yeah it's it's uh for porn it's so that everything looks tidy cinema nice. it looks sort of telegenic yeah hmm. tidy and nice because you want that when you're getting paid by some very gross person to do something that's probably only comfortable because of various other things that led to that and mm. it's just so exploitative and terrible all right well thank you for your time playing um rando questions rando. <laughs> We first met because you were a house concert host. I met you officially through Side Door, which is for the listener, a platform that connects venues with artists. I showed up, I fell in love with you and your and your kitty, kitties. There kitty. were two then. Two. I, lo- I really had a positive experience at your house concert, but mo- the best Yay. part about it was meeting you but I did want to ask you what you felt like on the topic of community and mental health, what role do you think a house concert and your house concert plays in that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the reason why I wanted to start to host concerts is because I knew I was going to be living in a town where I didn't know anyone. I just moved to Kingston, Ontario. And I knew I had a, a home that was big enough to do it. And I love hosting people. And so it lo- allowed me, whenever an artist came to stay and play, it allowed me to pretend that I had friends and host a party and have live music and feel like I was adding to the Kingston community and helping to support artists as they're traveling. And also everybody was gone by 11 and I'd had a full day <laughs> and mm-hmm. full night. And, and also like, hearing your humongous voice in my tiny place was like so lovely. And, and so generally folks who perform house shows are open to it, are nice. And generally every time I had a show, someone would show up and they would be like nervous to be a guest Mm. for some reason. And they would always leave having loved it. And so it it was uh, an easy win. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about your move to Winnipeg and how it's been on your head in your heart you move a lot how hmm. what how is that on you are you is it do you thrive on that do you is it like a reset it is a reset sort of except i'm not going to reinvent myself like this is it this winnipeg. is all you get moving to winnipeg was something that i and i told this to you but i work in the air force and uh and part of that means that we move every few years so that the Air Force doesn't become regionalized. And so I was in Kingston and I was excited to move to Ottawa because I wanted to be, remain sort of close to Nova Scotia. And mm-hmm. my second home is Toronto. And, and I wanted to be close to that team of people and yeah. folks in Montreal. And so when I was told that I was moving to Winnipeg, I mean, I'm a very adaptable person. And I was like, sure. I, it came as a bit of a blow. And I said, I know that I work at the pleasure of Her Majesty, but I also have it on good authority that Queen Elizabeth does not want me in Manitoba. So think mm. about that. Um, and it was all, it was meant to be a funny um, protestation. Mm. <laughs> but here I am in Winnipeg and it was funny. I saw um, Luke set was playing a show and uh I was talking with him and he just looked at me for a second and he just sort of said kind of under his breath, he was, he'd been touring and he was yeah. just like, where am I right now? Oh, you're in the right place. I'm in the wrong place. And he's like, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So moving to Winnipeg was like totally hard. And I remember at one point I was eating a pastry under a skyscraper and I was within 600 meters of my home and I just sat down and cried because I knew I needed a map to find my way home. Um, and I live right downtown. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, it's hard to move to new places, but so I'm like, okay, hey, what am I going to do? So I bought a car, um, which I have been trying to live without since my whole life, but I bought a car. Ooh. And in the last four months I have bought almost no gas. I have met a really wonderful team of friends who support each other and are hilarious and embrace each other's faults and 
flaws. So when somebody does something that's so very typically them, we're just like, yes, uh, do that thing that you do. And it's beautiful. And, uh, and that's really lovely. And I, I, I work for an organization which can be very problematic and riddled with toxic masculinity, but I have landed in a place where my boss is a fighter pilot who's a feminist Mm -hmm. and he's a dude and he talks about his privilege and uses it as a way to foster difficult conversations involving cultural shifting and I'm like oh whoa what that's amazing yep do you think he's on a mission like has he shared with you any reason as to why he is doing the work he's doing and and is the kind of person he is I mean, he shared one reason. He shared that if he hadn't been a fighter pilot, he would have probably been a counselor. Okay. So in, in order to work and he in a always, profession. Yeah. And he always like, when he's asking you questions, he's like, okay, what else? And he waits 10 seconds. And then you say something else. And then we talk about that for a while. And then he's like, what else? Wow. Nice. So- Until there's no more what else. And he has met every single person in the unit and he will give everyone time. And uh, also... Um, he divulged, he told me that um, someone who was very close to him had been sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. And through that, he came to understand that every woman that he met had been sexually assaulted. And I was like, Mm -hmm. what? I've never heard a man in the military actually use this language. And Mm -hmm. I was astonished. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty, uh, feeling pretty motivated Mm -hmm. um, at a time in the military where I was really like thinking about leaving. But um, because wow. it's a long, slow slog being a, a woman in an organization that can be problematic. And uh, so he, the fact that he wants to change things and that he has enact, invited me to do that with him, any suggestion I have along those lines, he's like, yeah, could this, yeah, I'll do that. Um, amazing. Well, he's he amazing. Wants, it sounds like he wants to learn from you and listen to you. He knows that he knows what you've well, been through. Like he, he didn't know. Oh, he doesn't. Well, he didn't. Like this was in our first conversation that we ever had, whether all of this came up. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, N- I don't want to like interrupt you, sir, because it's totally rude to interrupt anybody, but especially a higher ranking officer in the military construct. And, uh, and I was like, have you Googled me? And he's like, I have not. I'm like, Oh, you should. You might, should, you might yeah. want to. Yeah. <laughs> Did he? I, I don't know. I don't know if he did, but um, I gave him a little summary of my history of being publicly shamed. And he was like, oh, he's just someone who's curious about people. That's the thing, right? It's this, it goes back to like curiosity and empathy um, for people. Let's talk about um, some of the things you've done uh, okay. other than this for work uh, mm. that led you to this place, but in those, uh, this, you've done a lot of different things. Like I have a list here. I don't even think this is where you started, but I have here that you're a kindergarten teacher in South Korea. Was that yeah, just I was. like, was that to make money or was it like, oh, you like kids or what, what was the point of that at the time? And what'd you learn? Oh, my motivation for that was so weird. Like, yeah, I wanted to go to go somewhere to teach English as a second language to make money because the the money was going to go towards me getting trained as a Montessori teacher because I love small people and I do think that there's an opportunity lost if you're not listening to like a very young person who's maybe not fully verbal but they're curious about stuff so I wanted to tap into that in a way that was um, you know productive so I went to South Korea to do that but The reason why I chose to raise money that way was because uh, I was 27 and I wanted to go somewhere where I was a visible minority and I had no voice because I couldn't speak the language and where patriarchy was a bit more um, obvious. I just wanted to do that and see what it was like. And, Mm -hmm. and I uh, found it very interesting. I also wanted to go to a place where I couldn't talk myself out of trouble because I couldn't mm. get away with a lot. And so I knew I wouldn't be able to do that there. So Interesting. Um, I handicapped myself. There were things I loved about being there. I loved being really tall. I really uh, did love that. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. I'm like, I am tall. I know that's kind of shallow, how, but like, I'll never feel tall, that anywhere how else. How tall are you? I'm 5'8". Okay, you're pretty tall here. I'm pretty tall. 
but there you were really even tall. taller. Interesting. Yeah. I did that too. Uh, the, for some similar reasons, when I took a job in Germany, a little bit different. I mean, it, you know, you're still kind of around all these white people, but like, yeah, uh, I didn't speak the language. Um, I was nervous about doing anything wrong because I could be kicked out of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, I mean, not that I was a, a troublemaker, but anyway, I, so I can relate to that for sure. Yeah, it was an interesting trip. It was very hard, but um, I learned a lot there. The thing that I learned the most was that if somebody's doing something that's fucked up, there's a reason. Mm. Like, 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 why are you doing that? And on the days where I had the most culture shock, I would ask my adult students to list to me the things that they found so weird about Westerners. What mm -hmm. do you think Westerners do that are crazy? Oh, this. Mm -hmm. It's so weird that they do that, hey? Because, you know, I'd be like, oh, my God. I, hate it. Um, I didn't love South Korea. It was not. Um, I did get what I asked for. But what I didn't get, and the one thing that I didn't, that I presumed would happen, is I thought that I would make a friend. I did work with a dude. He was not someone who I had anything in common with at all. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one point, like I made him laugh a lot. I I'd always I could always get him to laugh. And uh, I remember I was watching David Letterman after I hadn't seen television in English for several months. And I felt like it was like illicit and I was watching Letterman and it made me laugh and it made me realize it was the first time I had actually laughed other than like a, oh yeah, that's kind of funny. Like, but like fully laugh since I had gotten to South Korea and had, that had been four months earlier. Mm -hmm. And I just envied this guy because I made him laugh every day and he never mm -hmm. did. Oh, anyway. that's, nice. that's, a, that's a great gift to be able to make somebody laugh. Well, I could make him laugh, you know, for a lot. Uh, um. <laughs> you're, you're funny. You're funny. Another thing you did, female voice on a computer game. Tell me more about that. Mm. And that was, was so that, fun. Was that for money, but then it became fun? No, um, it was fun. And then my friend I was like, here's money. The video game company Silverback, which is based out of Halifax, I actually had met this guy, Willie Stevenson, years before because he was working on a TV show that was produced in Halifax called Lex, mm. the science fiction show, which was kind of a gong show, but it was amazing. Anyway, Willie started this video game company and he and I knew each other a little bit and he asked me to be a voice for this video game. So that was quite fun because at the time that we were recording, because it was a few different times that we, that we went into the studio, I was actually working in the valley and living in the valley. And so he'd be like, Luce, come up on Tuesday. Uh, and I was like, I will come up if you feed me Indian food. And he's like, obviously I'm gonna feed you. So the video game recording was fun because I got to know him better. Oh, okay. And his partner, Colleen, I got to know them better. And so it was, and like, they paid me for it for sure. And the video game was, I guess, kind of a hit in that world. What's I'm not really called? a follower. Empress of the Deep. I don't know. And uh, <laughs> no, I mean, there are so many video games that the market's kind of hard to know everything, but it was fun. And also like the Empress who uh, I voice, she was a babe. And so I'm finally a babe in, uh, in a, Check a it out. Avatar kind it of way. Check it out, play it's, it. Yeah, so th well, that was fun to do. Well, that's good. You know, if you can find joy in your <laughs> in your work, that is the big reward, I think. It happened to me the other day, we were on a shoot and everybody who was working was just so wonderful and in their element and it all came together. It was, there was no stress and it was just such, you're, you know, it's like that, the, one of my favorite books called Flow, when you're yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, in, the mo in the moment, not mm -hmm, thinking about mm -hmm. the future, the past, and um, I guess this all ties so into the. So what? What? Yeah. What were you shooting? Were you music? Was it a music video? It was a. It was a performance music video, a stripped down version of uh, my new song "Stay with Me," which is that beautiful new song that you wrote. You. This is really why we're talking today to really just talk about, about your beautiful about song. My song, "Stay your with Me," heartbreaking uh, pandemic all, song. Yeah. Oh, God. I wrote that I even before even the that. pandemic. It's very, it, I wasn't, it was pre pandemic. What? Yeah. Because, and I think the reason I mentioned wearing masks, I was wearing masks on, on airplanes um, because I have always been afraid. Um, but especially in recent years of getting um, 
sick. And and the more we've toured in the last five years, the the more intense the uh, flus have been. And like, they'll just take you right out eight weeks, you know, for me being on tour, that's really scary. And, um, uh, it's, you know, threatening, uh, my livelihood threatens, yeah, threatened. Yeah, it did. And then of course the ultimate uh, flu comes along and does threaten my livelihood and, and everything. That oh God. Much to me. But, um, so yeah, I guess my, my, what some of my worst fears have come that was- through. And, uh, but that was pre pandemic. I wrote that. Yeah. So interesting. Cause as I was re- as I was listening to it, of course, any music that's coming out right now, I'm just feeling like they're all pandemic anthems. Sure. And so I projected that onto it and I was like, Oh yeah. Nugget. <laughs> Don't worry. Not all of the songs on my new album are going to be, um, a trip to bummer town, but there, there are some, they're heavy there. Some of them are pretty heavy though. Uh, but again, written pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic gave me time to finish them and and, and record them. So that's something to be ugh, grateful about. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, what were some of the top lessons from starring as Lucy in the Trailer Park Boys? So, so we sort of developed a friendship from one entity to the other, the Trailer Park Boys and the tragically hip universes uh, smashed in a really beautiful way. And um I remember um, those those guys came to set one day and I can be very shy. And so my day, way with dealing with that is like faking like I'm not shy. And Gord Downey is someone who I, I actually never really followed the hips musical um, legacy, but until I met Gord, but um, he was on set. And so I would, and a conversation trapped him and we had a lovely chat as we were, because I wasn't shooting this particular scene. Um, And so as we were talking, what I loved that I could point out to him, I was like, look at what's happening on set, not the action, but look at the crew. And there were just like, for example, there was somebody who had dropped something that they didn't notice they had dropped. And one of the crew members handed it back to them in a way that was just very flowy. And there was another dude who was walking behind somebody else and he put his hand behind their back just in case they stepped back so that they didn't, like get startled by him or whatever and there was just so much kindness amongst the crew to each other Mm. that was always a beautiful thing to see um another thing that I learned is um watching people get famous is interesting Mm. and how people deal with that attention is interesting and you can deal with it by becoming someone who is very conscious of the position that they've been offered and have higher expectations of what people will give them or you can understand the attention that's given to you and you can actually use your platform to foster good things. Yeah. Jonathan Torrens is someone who uses his platform in a to spread a little sunshine and goodness. Absolutely. Uh, and there were other folks on the show, like John, um, John Dunsworth is someone who loves, pe- loved people so, so much. And mm-hmm. for him being recognizable meant that he could talk to more people yes and uh, really really kind um and that so that was important yeah uh, also um there were other cases though where you saw how fame maybe changed people and not for the best in at that time no that that's why I left the show is because mm-hmm. fame had changed somebody not for the best mm-hmm. and um when people use their privilege to um be damaging to people um that's that's gross yeah and so um that's when I had to really separate myself from the show and the project and and uh, the people who uh, were were either behaving poorly or turning a blind eye to bad behavior in a criminal way I, I it makes me sad um because I just think how amazing that power that you, that celebrity would bring. I mean, I, I can only imagine that is what is so exciting to me about um, reaching more people, being better known, is that ability to then do better things, you know, be a part of like influencing in a good way. And, but I wonder sometimes if, if, um, you know, cause I mean, there are times in my life where, you know, I started to maybe feel a little overconfident about myself or, or something and, and was not acting my best self and, and maybe hurt people. And then, but then it hurt me so much that I, when I realized, oh, that I had done those things that drove me to want to be a better me for other people and be like preventative about 
hurting people. I wonder, so I think that happens at a diff for everyone at a different age. Like it could happen when you're 20, 25, but for some people that, that thing that changes them for the worse and then hopefully for the better happens in their forties or fifties. And I'm not excusing anybody, but like, I would hope that those people that were like that in your life have since come around, but some people don't. Yeah. Some people don't. I mean, I know that I have, I've changed so much uh, over my life, which is a good thing because I, I used to be, and I, well, I'd mentioned I'm kind of shy. And so I can overcompensate for that by being mouthy and saying stuff that um, I'm much more conscious of it now, but I used to say outrageous, rude stuff. And I was, I would never say something a lie meant to be malicious. Oh, okay. a lie, maybe, yeah. but I would never say something that was mean. Like, like I would, I always lean into joking but um, mm-hmm. I, I've, there have been times where I've taken it too far mm-hmm. and uh, usually I will know that, but sometimes I haven't known that. And so when I've tried to be funny, I've, I'm sure offended people and uh, I regret that because the, mm-hmm. that mouthiness came from a very um, weak place and trying to overcompensate for being for feeling like being in the wrong place and whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm definitely so much so aware of that now and do my best to not be that person. Um, my humor has changed so much ever mm-hmm. since I started talking publicly about sexual assault and all of the trappings of that. But yep. um, I made tons of mistakes for sure, like absolutely. And so I tried to learn from it, but you know, in the past, the folks whom I have encountered who've been really problematic, I, I dated a guy who was really, really a dangerous person. And then I also was very involved with the sexual assault trial with Jian Gameshi. And I don't think there's been a lot of growth probably in uh, that, that case, just because he wrote an article that was in the New York Review of Books about how hard it was to travel in the world when people thought you were a serial violent sex, sex offender, which would be hard to do. Mm-hmm. Especially if you are a serial violent sex offender. Mm-hmm. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would Don't be hard. Be like, yeah. Yeah. I would hate that. Uh, if everybody thought that I was a serial violent sex offender, that would suck. Um, but the- <laughs> nobody wants that. Yeah. Good. That's why they, they're yeah. so good at keeping it a secret. Yeah. You know, since the Me Too movement, I thought a lot about my own, even my own role in how I think and how I joke how I interact with men, which I still have to catch myself sometimes because at a young age, I learned how to, dif- I guess, deflect. And I'm, I'm still learning the words. Uh, yeah. And I'm not probably even say, talking about this, right. But like when I was um, approached by, you know, young men in my life, in my school, that uh, one in particular who was always saying very sexually offensive things and trying to get me to engage in the conversation and activities and whatnot that were totally inappropriate. But of course I wanted to impress that person and be cool. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I started learning the language and, and, you know, joking about all kinds of things and, and disgusting, hilarious. Yeah. And then Mm -hmm. in, you know, I learned how to use those things in other situations to get a laugh out of people because it was like for shock value. And I mean, I still have, I still do that, but I try to do it in, and in, in a, well, in a safer way, in a more respectful way for towards women and, and mm-hmm, men and everyone, mm-hmm. everyone, but myself as well. I mean, but yeah, I'll be in band practice and you know, be, I'll make a comment about even like, even when we, like, I think it's okay to, talk about body parts and not be, I don't think there should be shame attached to it, but like, I think uh, it's, it's trying to figure out like what, you know, if we make a joke about balls or breasts, like, is that, is this offensive to anybody or like, is it a trigger for anybody? Is yeah, this, I know. And, and it can get a little heady, but nowadays it's important to think about your audience and what you're doing and when, how you're, yeah. you know, what impact you're having lasting impact with the way the words that you use. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'm work, I'm struggling and working on it, but I haven't made a dick joke yet. I don't think I don't even have any good ones anymore. So, um, but try, that yeah, was, I mean, yeah, that was also part of trying to be like the guys I can totally relate. And you know what, when I was eight, 17, I moved away from my parents' house 
And I was starkly unprepared for the world that I w went into. And I was living in a ski resort in a, an apartment situation with eight dudes. And I was like, oh this can go very badly. And so I was like the dirtiest, the raunchiest, mm -hmm. the grossest. And I often am in a, an environment where I'm working with more dudes than women. And so when I was still working in film and before that whole um, Me Too situation, whatever, um, mm -hmm. I was still the grossest, the race to the bottom. Yeah. Um, and for me, I was always, but it was always the intent was just to make people laugh. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I missed the mark sometimes. I missed oh, the mark. Same, um, same. Yeah. And or did um, you? Or did you? Well, you may have, but also because you're a woman, you probably were oftentimes. I don't know if you've experienced this, but the sexism towards women for really saying anything that's mm. um, really saying anything, or or even swearing, like a girl that swears, mm. like but swears in a healthy way, you know. Still, I think swearing is hilarious. I think and, it's, uh, I think it extends your life. I think that science has proven that they've proven it, you know, and like, uh, there, there are ways to swear. Like if yeah. I'm mad at someone, I don't swear. Yeah. I don't swear. I'm be, I, I wouldn't be like you, you fucking whatever. But I mean, when you just, you're like, Oh fuck, you know, like, come on. I really wanted to eat. I, I like wanted, the rain. Really well, yeah. No, fuck it. Or like it. Oh, as, as a release, yeah. like as a, it's a release, release. and like, or like a, a, to emphasize that you're really fucking happy. Like that's not a bad thing. Okay, yeah. somebody gives you a snack. Yeah, is it yummy or is it the best fucking thing you've ever eaten in it's your the whole best life? Fucking well, depending on it's the best fucking thing. Yeah, you know. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, so yes, yeah, so in that way, you're you know how to emphasize something to really make someone know like the, how you appreciate them. Sometimes throwing in a curse word is done in the right way. Like if it's meant to But maybe to it's joy. not a curse word. Maybe it's not a curse word. Yeah, it's just, it's- There's literally curse. one curse word. What is There's it? one curse word and the curse word is damn. Beep. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. It's damn. Damn is really the only word that is a curse. Damn you. Like, cause it's an actual curse. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. See, like shit's not a curse word no fucking's not bad no consensual and if it's not consensual then it's rape so fucking is always good and a cunt is a vagina yeah that's a good thing i carry mine with me everywhere i go i have it only home without it emotions about mine but yeah yeah it's <laughs> and you were in the vagina in the vagina in i don't even know vagina in the vagina monologues as yeah. we we're covering a lot of ground, and, a lot of body parts. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah. hilariously, uh, I did the vagina monologues and I needed a way to, I couldn't make my monologue move. Mine was the cunt one because nobody, we were in Halifax and nobody else would say the cunt one. And I'm like, I'll do it. And um, I couldn't make it move. It wasn't quite ready. And so when I was a kid, I had a childhood friend and she and I would mock our British parents with a specific voice and a specific accent. And that was the accent and voice that I used to make the monologue better for me and funnier. I wish I had experienced, did you perform, <laughs> did, were, did, did you perform it in, at St. Mary's University in the theater there by chance? No, it was at the Neptune theater. Oh, what year would that have been? I was like, was like 2001 or two. Okay. Okay, that I wasn't around because uh, I did attend one once, but it was I thought, oh, I wonder if it was the same performance. But I know a lot of people no. perform the vagina monologues. But yeah, in the word, I mean, cunt, especially in overseas in the UK, is viewed as one of the strongest uh, swear words. To say. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's because it belongs to women and therefore there's a problem with it. Mm. And yet, toxic masculinity lies in conquering and acquiring as much as you can get. Yeah one of the missions of this podcast is to talk about, you know, breaking cycles. Can you think of any other ones that maybe we haven't covered or that you yes. are working on or you have tackled and you're like, I got that fixed. I had a complicated parent who um, was my, well, both of my parents, I guess are complicated, but um, my mother was a complicated parent and um, she's Pat, she's deceased. She has uh, crossed rainbow bridge and yeah. she is, doing that and um 
I remember when I was young, I wanted to write a parenting book to remember what it was like to be a parented person mm. so that any mistakes that I saw or missteps, they wouldn't repeat. And wow. uh, I you, don't have. How yeah. old would you have been when you had that like thought, I want to write this parenting, parented book, parenting? I was writing in pencil still. So I would have been young, seven. And I forgot to make any kids of my own, but um, when I am with children, depending on how old they are and all of the stuff, I temper my, like, I do think that with very young people, every exchange they have with an adult has a kind of a deep hit. And so I, I mean, I have an irreverent way of dealing with kids because um, I, I, the role that I have with all children is not, I'm not a parent, but I'm not a friend either because I'm too tall. So <laughs> um, there's always a, it's always a nurturing role, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And so I can get a beat on kids pretty quickly and I like to help them find their edges, but in a way that there's no risk for them. It's never dangerous. They always feel yeah. safe and listened to. Same. And um there are lots of kids in my life who are uh, now older. Um, and so they've survived the experience of being parented by me. And I just love the challenge of growing with a kid and changing the way I am with them so that it stays current. It's just very, very important, the voice of kids and, and, and giving them agency as much as is can handle and giving them choices from an, as early an age as possible. Yeah. so that they can start to navigate that and see what that feels like. And I've, I've gotten feedback from children who grew up and they told me what it was like to be taken care of by me and uh, not that much damage. I didn't do a lot of damage. That's, That's that is fantastic. I, I love and, working with yeah. kids. I yeah. love nannying. I think for me, it was important that because when I was young, I was, you know, not only not heard, uh, tried to be heard, um, shut down, lied to all these things. So I, from the get go, tried very, very hard. My, my hardest to listen, to make sure that the kids that I worked with knew that they were being listened to, mm-hmm. that everything they said mattered there, that to validate, you know, if they were feeling a certain way. And I think because I didn't have that emotional, yeah, you know, you had a complicated parent parents. Yeah. Um, (laughs) family parents. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but so that makes sense. And I think is important work, whether you, you know, chosen or forgotten, as you said, to, (laughs) to have your own children or not, you have, Mm -hmm. you know, when you do interact with kids, absolutely. And they, and kids look up to adults and they, you don't think of kids are going to notice or remember uh, they're paying attention. They're, they have time to like, we we're busy. We we're like, they have way more time than we do. And they're like more clearly open, absorbing. It's when you get older that you, you your memory starts to fail because you've bombarded yourself with too much shit. Um, so they are just soaking everything up, taking everything to heart. Yeah. 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 I've quizzed my nieces and nephews about this. And um, like, there's, there's stuff that, um, that I've done with them once. And they're like, remember all those times we did that? And I'm like, that was one time. We did it once. It only happened once, but it can just, you know, um, be kind of sewn in there. I mean, yeah. my niece, one of her earliest memories of me is from something. I used to dance with her around the kitchen, but she mm-hmm. couldn't really walk. Mm-hmm. She wasn't really walking. And so I'd pick her up and we'd dance around the kitchen and I would dip her. Aww. And that's her earliest memory of hanging out. And she wasn't vocal or she wasn't verbal yet. I love that she thinks that's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Your, you know yeah and and so you don't know what kids are pick what they're gonna glom into and um anyway but I try to deal with all people like that and, yeah. until and there are some people who I, I'm just like oh you're just not gonna be someone who I can invest in so just yeah, let you sure. do your thing yes <laughs> while well, you have to protect your everyone has to have boundaries too. Um, I have a couple little books here this is my book of reminders this is my book of prayers uh-huh. that I made do you have any um, like uh, tattoo worthy quote worthy sayings? I mean, sometimes we're talking and you you throw things at me and I'm like, how did you remember 
I mean, I, I remember some Oprah quotes, like loves in the details. Like, yeah. I, that was like That's the one, one television show I like gave myself permission to watch when I was growing up and I didn't watch TV otherwise, cause I thought it would take away from my life. And so, yeah, if there, do you have any, uh, for the listener, um, any favorite quotes or, or messages that you care to share before we wrap this beautiful chat with heart that we call, I call my listener, uh, my little heartbeats. Oh, that is so, so lovely. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to say to the heartbeats, any quotes mm. or, um, or just tips or tricks for life that, mm-hmm. uh, take homes from today or you know yeah there's this woman whom I met who his name is Anita Cody Mm -hmm. and she um when I met her she was 50 or 55 and she was just a cool lady who lives in Cape Breton Cape Breton is in Nova Scotia Cape Breton Island yeah and she uh and I only met her once but um she's super cool like physically a very strong person really community oriented she was a woman who's a real academic and a real feminist and she uh had built a cool life around herself Mm -hmm. and I kind of asked her um about that and she said oh in my life there are no have to's so that -hmm. doesn't mean she's not constantly getting shit done Mm -hmm. but she's getting shit done because she wants to get it done Mm -hmm. like nobody really loves like hard work is kind of a drag but when it's done it's great so it's true that language I think is so important and so that is something that reminded me about framing things (sighs) so powerful you're right yes because oftentimes I say that to myself and then I get upset I have to have this done I have to do this this like even this week and I said I don't have to actually do that thing that I've been, that's due next week that someone else told me I have to do, or I should do. I actually made it out for myself that I had to do this and it's not helping and I don't have mm-hmm. to do that. And then when I finally <laughs> was like decided, I was like, Oh yeah. And I'm constantly reminding myself when I'm doing hard work, if it isn't always pleasant because it isn't always Mm. sometimes you actually do have to meet deadlines and whatnot and that reminding yourself of the reason that you're doing it and feel that feel that you know and then you know that you'll get to that point where you can not bask in the glory of but like you know Mm -hmm. where you have that feeling of accomplishment or joy from the work or you start to see it in action and and it's a long game right so but I love that that it's a long game and I I try to frame like like, and, and so in dealing with kids, like instead of saying, don't open the cupboard that they were going to open, mm-hmm. you're like, keep it closed. Mm. I love asking people like, How, what can I do to help you? Yeah. You and whenever that. I say that yeah. people find that really disarming. And then I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. here to do something that you need. So, and so, so, yeah. um, so that whole have to thing is like, it helps refocus difficult, difficult things. Um, it helps reframe things. I mean, there are definitely things that are, that absolutely need to happen. Brushing teeth is but, a good uh, It doesn't have to happen, but it's a good idea. Brush your teeth. Yeah. Or like, if you don't do the thing, it's going to suck more. So do the thing. Just do it. Uh, do your taxes, people. Oh yeah. Oh, that reminds me. I've got to pay some more taxes to people. But at the end of the day, everyone's trying to do stuff and like you know I fail a lot uh but I really strive to not be a jerk and I strive to like yield to people in traffic and I try every Mm -hmm. day to give a stranger a compliment it really goes a long way you know yeah thank you so much it was really I feel so lucky that um you invited me to talk to your heartbeats because um mm. i know that uh so how much time you spend thinking about these people as you're making your Aww. music and it's um very beautiful so thank you and uh squeeze down for me in a consensual mostly consensual way mostly yeah welcome to the heartbeat hotline one nine zero two six six nine four seven six nine. I'm the host of a Chat with Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. A Chat with Heart, produced and written by me, Christina Martin, co-produced and engineered by Dale Murray. Check out Dale's website, dalemurray.ca. 
podcast theme song, Talk About It, was written by me and recorded by Dale Murray. You can find it on all the places you stream music. Production plans for this podcast and season one are supported by the province of Nova Scotia's Women in Business Implementation Fund and the Creative Industries Fund. Special thanks to Terrence Taylor for mentoring me on hosting this podcast and really digging deep with me on my production plans for season one, which, let's be honest, Terrence, ended up being more like well-needed psychotherapy for me. To Crystal Seaberger at Sensory Friendly Solutions, thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me learn how to be a more inclusive, accessible, and sensory-friendly human. Visit my Patreon page to become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. Sign up at patreon.com forward slash Christina Martin. For this to be a massive success and reach 7 billion people, I need you to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeats, a great day.